All right, welcome into our third edition of the MLB Draft Town Hall, where we bring together some different publications from around the country, talk a little bit about the draft, talk about what we're hearing, what we're seeing, some of our opinions, and just go to town. Uh, I'm Joe. I'm with Prospects Lives, of course. We got Jonathan Mayo, MLB.com, MLB Pipeline, Brian Sikowski of Perfect Game. And, uh, and joining us this time is actually Kyle Glazer of Baseball America. Really excited to have Kyle on the program. Uh, Kyle. Welcome, man. How you doing? Doing all right. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Brian, Jonathan, you guys hanging in there? Doing okay. Ready all to right. roll, man. Yep. All right. Cool, man. Well, let's just jump right into this. Um, I wanted to kick things off a little bit with a guy that I think is worth a lot of discussion because he's one of the most uh, mercur- mercurial guys in the class. Um, let's talk about Ben Joyce. Uh, we've never seen a guy that throws 105, Not not at the college level, not routinely at least. Um, it's been a while since we've seen a pure reliever drafted in the first round. Nick Birdie is the first that kind of came to mind. Um, let's start with you, Brian, kind of, how would you value Ben Joyce? Where does he fit in this class? And, uh, how, how would you project him out? He is a wild one, man. Cause like, even if you don't have an opinion of your own, like asking people you hear, oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to take him if he's there in the third. And then other teams are like, there's no chance I'm touching that guy before the seventh or the eighth or whatever. And so I, I saw him at Kentucky, dude. He sat 102, 103. I've never, ever in my entire life seen that. And it didn't matter. It, di- <laughs> it didn't matter. Kentucky was racing to the, to the plate. So I, I, I think there's perhaps more so than any other like fourth year college guy ever. You have to go on what it might be way more than what it has been, like your data to, to, to date on this mm-hmm. guy. Because Vitello doesn't trust him. Like, we know that. that there's, there's so many guys he'd pitch over that guy, so there's something to be said for that. Yep. So, like, I, I don't know, bro. Like, I, it's hard for me to not say I'd take that in the top 120 picks or so, like call it four rounds because he literally does throw 105. But it – <laughs> At it doesn't some matter point. sometimes, which is wild. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't think enough people are, are probably talking about the fact that, you know, Chad Cordero and, and, and Nick Birdie and, you know, Drew Storen, these guys could command the fast. Like, they knew exactly where it was going. And there was a reason that these guys were getting drafted where they were. And Ben Joyce, for the love of God, I mean, he's just sacrificing these 19-year-olds to the gods. They're swinging before the ball leaves his hand. Um, Jonathan, where, where do you lie? Because there's not a lot of guys that – average 102 and a half miles an hour uh every pitch for 60 pitches well first i want to give you kudos for trying to use the word mercurial 30 seconds into this you know i struggle to land that word like he struggles to land a slider yeah i think you know the the (laughs) thing that's so challenging to figure out about him is yes so he throws super hard and he's missing bats but you know he pitches one day then he can't pitch again for another week I mean, what is that? You know, so and and the fact to Brian's point that like the staff there doesn't trust him. If you were trustworthy with that kind of stuff, you would be seeing him in high leverage situations, or or maybe more frequently. But he can't seem to handle it, and there's no track record. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think someone's going to roll the dice in the top five rounds. You know, but like I, I wouldn't. I don't know that I would take him. You know, unless you're getting a deal of some sort. Uh, you know where you're, you're offsetting the the obvious you know breakdown risk here mm-hmm. yeah it, which made the uh the start this week even more I, I was very surprised by that i know that vitello was trying to get beam away from the innings and and tidwell away from the innings and got you know burns and 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 dollard said all of they got a million of them um but starting ben joyce i thought was a was a decision because that's an arm that you need at the end of the game in omaha um, Kyle, where are you on Ben Joyce? Have you ever seen anything like it? And kind of where would you put him? Uh, certainly haven't seen a guy sitting 102, 103, touching 105.5. That's for darn sure. I, I mean, look, we're way past the day of college relievers getting drafted in the first round. You know, Casey Weathers going eighth overall. That that doesn't happen anymore. That would never happen again today. And those guys you talked about, Storr and Cordero, longer track record, through more strikes. I do think we have to give Joyce a little bit of credit here. He's only about three walks per nine. It's not like he's a wild man. This isn't Burl Caraway a few years ago where you never knew if he was going to be anywhere near the strike zone. And the Cubs took him in the second round, and that's been an absolute disaster. Um, you know, I, I look it, – it's tough. I, I think at the end of the day it probably falls into that third round range. I kind of think about it 
I, again, the Cubs are one of my systems. So I think about it from the standpoint of you have Burl Caraway, who was this hard throwing reliever. Now he was a lefty, but he was clearly reliever only. People love the stuff. He went in the second round. That's been a disaster. Then you had Luke Little, who was super famous after touching 104 in that workout video posted to Twitter, but it lacked context, which was he had really no track record. He really does not have a good delivery. He's really struggled to stay in shape, like all these negatives. And, and part of the reason he's a low A reliever who will look really good one day and really not good the next. And he went in the fourth round. I think Joyce is probably somewhere in the middle. Again, teams are really, really, really wary of taking college relievers high for the most part nowadays. We yeah. see them third round tops. I, I think maybe that third, fourth range is where someone rolls the dice, but some of it's going to depend on how he finishes the season as well. There, there's still two months till the draft. Yeah, and I think we can probably all agree that whoever's going to bite is going to be someone that has a has a path to use him now, to use him either this year or you know mid season next year. Because Ben Joyce is not a guy that you throw in your system and try and turn into a starter despite getting a start this year. I mean, he's a guy that he, you don't know how many bullets he's got left. You know, you you want to get those uh, at the big league level as soon as you can. Any disagreement there? Where's Kevin Copps right now? Right. Double A. Double A. Yeah. It's one of those things. People talk about guys racing to the majors the same year. It just it doesn't really happen. You know, Holden Powell, I heard that. Kevin Copps, I heard that. It's it wouldn't be this year. It would still be next year at the earliest. There's still a timeline here you have to work with. Well, I mean, I don't think he's got enough of a track record of throwing strikes that yeah. you know you could just say you put him up there. I do get that idea. Like get him there if you can, because who who knows when you know that that time bomb's gonna go off. But uh but I think he has to show that he actually can find the strike zone consistently against good hitters uh, before you do that. Yeah, and I think that's an important designation, Jonathan. Just because he, like Kyle said, he isn't walking a lot of batters, his zone percentage isn't that robust. I mean, he's not in the zone as much as uh, as much as much some of his numbers might suggest. But um, let's jump into another topic, kind of maybe guys that are more on the mend, guys that are healing from uh, Tommy John. I know uh, Joyce is already there, but... Anybody have any specific expectations for Kamar Rocker here? It was just announced that he's going to do some indie ball up in, in the Northeast. We've got Wisenhunt, who's going to be pitching for Chatham uh, in the Cape. We don't know how many innings these guys are going to do. Connor Prelip's going to do a showcase in, uh, in Hoover here in the next couple of weeks. Jonathan, kind of start with you. For me personally, the college, the, the injured college pitcher this year might represent the best value that you can get at the end of day one and, and day two. Um, where do you land on some of these guys? Well, I think they're kind of, we need to sort of individuate them a little bit because they're not all, it's not all the same story, you know? So with rocker, uh, it's going to be a very controlled setting. Uh, so I think it's going to, you know, people are going to have to take that for what it is. He's going to have to go out and show that he can pitch that the stuff is the same. He's also going to have to share his medical information. Yeah. Uh, you know, because there are just way too many question marks with what happened with the Mets last year for anyone to feel comfortable. I don't care if he goes out and throws 98 to 102. If he's not going to share medical info, they're going to wonder if what the Mets saw is what everyone said. Now, I do think that someone's likely to take a chance anyway. Uh, late first supplemental if he goes out and throws and the stuff is up there. But if he's throwing, what, two, three inning stints for, for a month before the draft, I don't know how much that's going to tell you. Uh, Wizen Hunt's a whole different thing, right? Because it's not, that wasn't an injury. I think in addition to him going out and showing what the stuff looks like, uh, people are going to have to feel comfortable, you know, that the reasons he was suspended aren't going to cause a problem, you know, moving forward. Um, Prelip is probably the guy that I think has the most to gain if he goes out and shows health because there are plenty of teams that have shown that they're not afraid to take a guy, especially a college guy who's had Tommy John surgery. And this will be already on the, on the back end of the rehab and getting on a mound process. So uh, I think he is probably of that group that you mentioned, Joe, the one who's most likely to move up, uh, you know, up into the, maybe as high as the middle of the first round, if, if he goes out and throws well. Yeah. And not for nothing. I mean, Prelip and, and Wisenhunt, are both lefties and they've both shown velo at one point or another. That's not exactly easy to come by. Uh, Kyle, how about you? I mean, the main storyline to me out of all these three is going to be Kamar Rocker after everything that happened with the Mets. You know, one of the things that I think people have to keep in mind is anytime a team has not signed a guy over concerns about the elbow, 
the team has generally been right. The Astros were concerned about Brady Aiken, and we heard all the things about, oh, the Astros screwed him and didn't do him right, and yada, yada, yada. Well, guess what? His elbow gave out a year later. He was never the same. Um, when the Rays drafted Drew Rasmussen 31st overall, again, didn't sign him over concerns about the health. You heard all the, oh, you know, the team's just being cheap, yada, yada, yada. No, Rasmussen needed a second Tommy John surgery. And again, he ended up being fine in the long term. But the point is, teams don't draft guys to not sign them. Like for no. them to not sign them, there has to actually be something really wrong. And generally speaking, the history says when teams don't sign a guy because of an injury concern, the team is generally right. So for me, seeing Kamar Rocker, like Jonathan said, share his medicals, but also go out, show he can hold the stuff over five, six sendings. If he's just throwing two inning stints in a controlled environment, that doesn't answer any of the questions anyone has. Um, I think to me, that's going to be the number one thing I'm watching, how much medical information he discloses to teams and what the length of the outings are, not just what he does over two or three innings. Zach? Yeah, I agreed with Jonathan hundred percent on prelip being the guy who, who might have the most to gain here. I, it's his is the most cut and dry thing, right? Like he had Tommy John. Everybody knows it. Everybody's seen it. He's rehabbing. He's going to throw. This is what he was pre-COVID and whatever. Like I, he's the most cut and dry one. So if he comes out and like is is just good, I don't even think he has to be unbelievable because how can you be unbelievable in a bullpen? But just come out and be good, and you're fine, and you look healthy, and medicals check out, and here we go. We're drafting the guy that we thought was a one-one candidate a couple years ago. Um, but the other two, I, Kumar, I, <laughs> I'm absolutely in Kyle's camp here as far as like teams don't just do that. You know, like that is not just the thing that happens. It, something was wrong. Something was very wrong. Um, I don't know how like confirmed the rumors were that came out that they it was like agreed upon at six mil or whatever it was. And then they reneged or whatever, whatever it ended up being. But if, if that's true, then that's a six million dollar arm that someone agreed to pay that mm -hmm. then the medical bank. So like there is something concerning there. And I don't know if two inning stints once a week for three weeks are going to uh, dissuade any, any of the worry about that a hundred percent. And Wizenhunt, I don't, I don't really, he took steroids. Cool. Like, let's see how it looks on the Cape first rounder. If he's good, like probably you know. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. yeah like, that was pretty gun dry. Me. Like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the rocker thing. And then we'll finish with this. What, what, where's his variance? Because I see it as a, as a guy that if he's not willing to share his medicals, he's not willing to go more than two innings. Is this an arm that can fall out of the top three rounds? Is this an arm that there's enough worry about that can fall out of the top five or six rounds? I mean, does anyone have an opinion in the group as to where the floor might be? It's really, really tough without knowing what exactly the medical shows. Um, I do think because there is such a lack of college pitching this year, and let's not forget, this was one of the best college pitchers in the country the last time he was actually on the mound. I mean, the talent's undeniable. Maybe ever. You know, I, I think I have a hard time seeing a team, especially in this draft, it's so, so shallow and there's so little pitching where you get to the end of the second round, you start looking at some tooled up high school guys who you don't really think you're going to hit or some college arms you don't love. I mean, I think about a guy like, you know, Drew Thorpe out here at Cal Poly. You know, perfectly nice arm. He's durable. He's, but you know, it's it's eighty eight to ninety two. It's a, it's really breaking ball heavy. And teams are talking about him in, you know, the fifties or the sixties. I mean, would you rather have him or Kamar Rocker? And I say this as someone who likes Drew Thorpe, but I would probably take a shot on Kamar Rocker as long as the medical isn't you know red flags everywhere. So I mean, I I think realistically with the nature of this class, I don't see him falling too terribly far. But again, so much of that is subject to what exactly is on the medical yeah and everyone every player has a number i mean money comes into this but i i tend to fall into your camp i just think he the track record the pedigree it's too long for him to fall out of the top 75 picks i mean that's such a steal if you rewind one year ago today to think you can get kamar rocker at 60 for example jonathan brian either one of you got any you know inklings on on where that variance may be where the margin lies I, I mean, I think Kyle kind of hit it on the head. Like, it's just so hard to know with the, the unknown since we, you know, I, I almost would, would rather not speculate just because, yeah. you know, we don't know that there could be plenty of teams that are looking at him in that like backhand, back end of the first round sandwich, you know, uh, competitive balance round area. Mm -hmm. And then they look at the medicals and then they're going to be out, you know, so I, I think it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to know. It's 100% going to depend what's on the – like, if it's, you know, 
X, Y, if it's X, then everybody's going to be in. And if it's Y, then nobody's going to be in. So I, we, there really is, I don't think you can pinpoint a rank, yeah. you know, period. Like if, it, if it's one, one or two different things, then like he's, it's not going to go well, you know, yeah. regardless, but yeah, I tend to so, think if it's an elbow, he's, he's going to go fine to be honest with you. So um, there's been a lot of guys that have needed Tommy John surgery yeah. that have gotten plenty of money. Um, all right, let's jump over the college ranks uh, or the, the college ranks, the college hitter ranks couple of guys this year um, haven't quite lived up to the expectations that I think a lot of us were expecting. Um, Robert Moore comes to mind. He struggled a bit at Arkansas. Um, Judd Fabian has scuffled a little bit, but it's more of a repeat of what he did last year. And then a couple of other guys, Carter Young at Vanderbilt kind of hasn't, you know, eliminated some of the strikeouts. And then Brock Jones has been surging lately, but probably hasn't been the player that a lot of people maybe were hoping he would be. Any of these guys specifically stand out for you? Um, anybody here that you guys still like in the first round? I'm not going to bury Bob Moore quite yet. Um, I, he's still 19 or whatever, like or like he's 20 in a month or something. He's still yeah. a child. And, and there's something to be said there about how we, we kind of, like I said earlier, we, we kind of said the same thing about Fabian last year, right? Like, well, he's young. We'll see next year, whatever. I just like. I'm not going to bury him yet. I think he's he's still too good. The the batted ball data is a little bit better than what I expected it to be. Not that it's standout or anything, but it's not like a, a big deficit. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think I'd take that guy in the first round, but of the ones you mentioned, maybe he's the closest to it. Yeah. yeah you know, Brock Jones is interesting. You know, of all these guys we're talking about, you know, Moore's batting under 240, Fabian's under 250. You know, Jones, for all his struggles, is, is up over 300 now. Um, the, the thing with Brock Jones is he's just – really 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 streaky um when you catch him right as we saw during the postseason last year it was you know ungodly amazing but there have also been way too many times where there's just nothing there there's nothing happening and it really just depends on what do you believe do you believe the the two months a year where he's just uh, on fire and no one can get him out is the real version of him do you, or do you believe that you know you just are going to have to settle for every year. You're, you're going to get nothing for two months and then you'll get two great months and you kind of take the hits with the misses. I, I It's tough, but I, I have spoken to high level decision makers with some teams that say they wouldn't take them till the fourth round because they don't trust the bat to consistently be good enough. I've spoken to other evaluators who still say, yeah, I would still take them back of the first calm early second, just because you look at the athleticism, you look at the tools. And again, at the end of the day, you look at the, the total performance he's kind of outperforming all these other guys by again, you know, 50, 60, 70 points of average. And he's still got 12 bombs, like his bad year, so to speak, the grand scheme of things has not been terrible. Yeah. yeah I think, I think he's the one who has, because he's, he, he even came into the years as, as that intriguing college guy who actually has pretty good amount of ceiling. He hadn't figured all of it out, even with the good year last year, you know, two sport guys. So you think maybe there's more to unlock the, the more he concentrates to get him into pro ball, uh, with pro instruction, I think there might be more belief that he's a guy who can figure it out or at least is so athletic enough that even if he is as, as streaky as that, he's still going to be a valuable big leaguer. While the other guys that, you know, some of those bats to ball skills are, are a little concerning. Could Judd Fabian still sneak into the back end of the first round? Sure, he could, you know, if, if they're willing to make some sort of deal. Uh, you know, the power is clearly real and, and the, the defense in center field is real. Um, you know, if you'd asked me this question, if you know a month ago, I actually felt pretty strongly that he was going to be a first rounder based on uh, the, the the cut down in the strikeout rate. And then, you know, as it got deeper into conference play, it kind of went south. Now, if he rebounds and, and plays well, you know, down the stretch and postseason and things like that, then he he's probably in the same neck of the woods that he was last year. You know, he's still, still got questions uh, that were evident last year. Um, and if you don't care as much about you know, contact rates, then maybe you take a chance because of that power. Yeah, I think um, just to add on to Kyle's Brock Jones point, the thing that really interests me about that guy, he ran such an extraordinarily high walk rate last year with a lot of lineup protection, and he's doing it again. I, I mean, he's got hitters around him, and he's still running a very high walk rate. So the approach is clearly there. I know there's some swing and miss, but I think that's a guy that, you know, if he has another – off season or postseason like he did last year and he ends up at that 340 mark uh, i would be surprised if he makes it out outside of day one he's got a lot of tools um all right 
So speaking of Robert Moore, kind of on that same path, uh, let's talk a little bit of of lineage because that's kind of the tail of the tape this year, right? Uh, Drew Jones, uh, Jackson Holiday, Elijah Green to a lesser extent with the with the football background, uh, Justin Crawford. There's a lot of guys with you know not only big league dads but Hall of Fame dads. I wanted to ask. Uh, let's ask you, Kyle, first because I, I've never asked you this question. Do you believe that? lineage do you believe that bloodlines is an ultra positive trait is it a tool is it a characteristic in a player or is it just happenstance uh it absolutely can be again i think so many so much of the time we talk about you know tools and physicality and you certainly have to cross certain thresholds of those but when you start talking about the separators so much of success in professional baseball you know whether it's single a double a all the way through the majors is knowing how to navigate the lifestyle, being it on your own, knowing how to navigate a clubhouse, dealing with the media, dealing with the pressures of fans, every failure being you know, front page on newspaper online the next day. And a lot of these guys, they're just better prepared. They know what's coming because of their dads. In a lot of cases, they've been in big league clubhouses. A lot of times they saw their dads going through it and how their dads handled it. I think it really is a huge advantage just in sort of knowing you know, what they're walking into and knowing how to you know, kind of compose themselves, whether it's dealing with teammates, coaches, unruly fans, whatever, how to live out on their own a little bit, or when they have questions, have someone that can call who has been there. Um, again, that that's something that's just so, so, so valuable. So again, will having lineage make up for the fact if you just aren't good enough? No. But once you cross a certain threshold of tools and talent and ability, that lineage absolutely is an extra boost. Jonathan, I want to tack on a piece to this just because um, I know that you guys have just released some new some new boards. And I know you did as well, Kyle. But do you think uh, do you think the Blue Jays recent success with all of these different guys, do you think that sways decision makers, scouting directors, general managers a little bit as it turns to draft season? Uh, I, I don't know if it's the success that the Blue Jays have had with, you know, the, the, the sons of um, I think they would more likely look at it in totality. Obviously, the Blue Jays have done a very nice job of, at, at drafting or signing uh, those guys and, and have had, gotten them to the big leagues and they've had success. But I think you have to look at it, you know, across baseball. Uh, first and foremost, like this just all makes me feel really old. <laughs> um, I mean, I covered Carl Crawford in the Futures game, for Pete's sake. So um, we're getting to the point where prospects kids are now turning into prospects. But um I'll, I'll put that aside for, for the moment. I think the thing that's interesting, and you know, and to Kyle's point, is that it's rare when there's both nature and nurture uh, at the same time. And you know, the the nature part of it is like, well, you know, how much of it is in the genes, uh, you know, whether it's athleticism or things like that. And then the nurture, you know, growing up around the game and understanding how it works or how to prepare and things like that. I think all of it matters. And you know, I think that if you have a, a, a guy and Kyle, I like how you put it, that, that crosses a certain threshold and, but maybe there's still some, some risk involved. You might have a much better feel for the risk. If you know that that player knows what it takes to get to the highest level because they, they, they grew up, uh, you know, they grew up around it. How about you, Zach? I absolutely agree with both points. I don't think it's a determiner, but I absolutely think it's a, I'd rather have someone who has that than doesn't all things else being equal. You know, I think that's the best way to sum it up. Uh, I'd rather have it than not. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the first pick because if we've learned one thing, it's that Mike Elias and, and the Baltimore Orioles do not make things uh, cookie cutter. I, I mean, it's never chalk. So, there's a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different rumors, a lot of different smoke out there right now about uh, the Orioles going with maybe Brooks Lee or going with Jackson Holiday. You've got Drew Jones and Elijah Green and Tamar Johnson on the board. Um, where do you guys think they'll go? And do you think this is the year to maybe veer away from one of these, what some people believe to be generational preps? Zach, go ahead, man. Oh, OK. I was just <laughs> I didn't want to be rude. Um Man, I don't, I don't know. I think Elijah's the best player, so I would take him. But that's mm -hmm. a simplistic view of it. Uh, um, <laughs> I would call them all and see which one wanted the least amount of money. Man, I don't know because I don't have, 
I don't have those college guys graded the same as I do the high school guys. Yeah. So I wouldn't take them ahead of the high school guys unless I was going to save so much money that I was sure I could get someone else graded similarly down the board. You know, so if you have that assurance and that's the game we play every year, uh, then sure, like let's take Parada and pair him with Jack's float Ferris down or something, whatever. Right. Um, but I, if, if we're just talking in a vacuum, like I'll take the best player and I think that's Elijah or Drew. So, I, you know. Yeah, that's the tricky thing is kind of you, you have to couple whoever they take from the college ranks with the high schooler that they land mm. with their second, third or fourth pick. What about you, Kyle? Where are you at? <laughs> so to answer a couple of your questions, um, is this the year to do it? And the answer is no. Uh, again, just speaking with evaluators, you know, across the game, um, you know, there's a pretty consensus opinion. And, and Brian, I know you, you feel differently, but just talking to, to individuals across the game that Drew Jones is the clear cut best player in this class. And then that two to five group of Kevin Prada, Brooks Lee, Elijah Green, Tamar Johnson, Jackson Holiday. That's where kind of the mix starts. You know, you talk to five different people to line those five guys up five different ways. But there is a clear cut number one in the eyes of a lot of officials who I trust and have really, really good track records. You know, the time to go under slot with a first overall pick, really, you should probably never do it. But if you're going to do it, it's a year where, you know, there's five guys and you truly believe they're all equally talented. And then you just say, OK, which one will take? the cheapest deal. We saw that last year with the Pirates and Henry Davis. You talk to a lot of people and they would say, yeah, you know, Lawler and Mayer and Rocker and Leiter, you know, Davis is right there. That group of five was all equivalent in a lot of people's eyes. That's a case where you go ahead and do this. Um, I actually have a story coming out uh, here in the next week or two that looks at the career outcomes for number one overall picks. It is so, so, so much greater than number two overall picks, number three overall picks. Like I was stunned what the gap is. If you have a draft where there's a clear cut number one player and you do not take him, you are doing your franchise a disservice. It's not, oh, well, we float it down and we can pair them and spread the risk around. You're not spreading the risk around. You're taking four dives instead of a dollar. That dollar is still way more valuable, even though it's one versus four. Um, so in terms of what the Orioles will do, the early intel I received is they were targeting Jacob Berry as a potential you know, underslot option. Um, his injury has sort of change that dynamic. Uh, I've heard a lot about them being very, very in on Jackson Holiday, uh, Michael Elias in particular being very interested. So we'll see what they do. But in terms of what they should do based on where things stand today, given how much the industry believes Drew Jones is the clear cut best player, the Orioles should just take him and pay him and they'd be doing their franchise a disservice if they don't. How about you, Jonathan? What's your philosophy? Yeah, I don't know if the separation between Drew Jones and and Elijah is that great. I think it might depend on who you talk to, but I, I've gotten the same sort of information that I mean that's why we have him number one on our board, mm -hmm. you know. And, and you know, the thing that I you know, I often think, first of all, guy who goes one one doesn't sign for that full slot, like ever. You know, you still can save money and take the best guy. Um, you know, m more often than not. Now does you can save enough to, you know, really aggressively go after someone with your next pick, you know, uh, not necessarily though, if you have extra picks, you have a little more flexibility. I think, you know, there's always the danger of being too smart. You know, uh, the Orioles the last two years have done that uh, and tried to get guys down to them. And that guy wasn't there, you know, over their next pick. So you may target a guy with that. You need to have, you know, a plan B, C, and D. I think the pirates kind of, uh, use that strategy almost to perfection by being so aggressive with the three high school guys they took next, you know, now we have to see how those guys go out and if they make it to the big leagues, obviously, but that's, that's how you need to do it. If you're going to do it. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I think there are enough sort of questions about the college guys. Uh, you know, one, you know, with Jacob Berry, I, even before the injury, I was getting just a very general lack of enthusiasm, which honestly, I didn't, I didn't really understand given that he was a college performer, right? It, it was putting up numbers again, but uh, that would save them the most money. Um, and then with Brooks Lee, because of his injury history, that, that's another question mark. Well, do you want to, to do that, especially given what's transpired with the Orioles and Hessen Kerstad? So, you know, I, I think there are too many question marks there. I, I would take the best player on the board. Um, you know, if say they end up taking Elijah Green because he'd signed for a little bit less than Drew Jones, I don't think anyone would, 
you know, cast aspersions at, at, at that just because they're both very, very talented players. Even Tamar Johnson, I think, could be in, in that mix. But you have to really, really believe that guy is going to hit like most things. Because if you're going to take a five foot eight sec, high school second baseman, uh, one one, he 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 better be Jose Altuve. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to call a quick audible before we go to the last question. Um, Dylan Lesko recently went down with an injury. Uh, Tommy John, we see it a lot. Uh, but his track record is four or five years deep. And Brian, you'd know this better than anyone. Does his injury change anything for you in terms of the top of the high school pitching class? Is he still your presumptive one, one high school pitcher or does it, does it close the gap a little bit between him and Ferris or Duquesne or Barriera? I mean, I think in terms of like where they'll go, like, yeah, it closes mm-hmm. the gap a little bit, but in terms of like how I'd value them, I, I'm not a I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. I don't know that his TJ is perfect or and everything's going to go great. But like if we're operating under the assumption that it that it's fine, then yeah, I, that was the best guy. I'd keep him the best guy. I Duquesne has just kind of fallen off in recent weeks, and uh, as my pinned tweet will tell you, one week doesn't make a draft stock. Um, but I I think Porter's probably the next guy. Uh, if we're talking righties after Lesko, um, but and I don't know Barrera after that, we'll see. But like I again to answer to make a long story short, like he was the guy we had first. Um, I still believe he's the best high school pitching talent I've ever evaluated, and I, yeah, I would take that guy. Jonathan, Kyle, do either one of you have a have a draft crush as it pertains to high school pitchers? I wouldn't call it a, a draft crush by any means, but I, I do think, you know, of all the guys you mentioned, who's the, the second best outside of Dylan Lesko, you forgot the guy who might actually be second best. And that's Robbie Snelling, the left-hander yeah, out in Reno. Um, My East Coast a, bias, I apologize. Yeah, no, this is, this is a guy who has just been rapidly climbing up boards. And you start comparing him to some of these other top high school pitchers you talked about. He's the one that kind of combines – delivery, athleticism, three pitches, control. A lot of those other guys have, you know, two of those four or five things, and you have to project a little bit. He's the guy that combines kind of all of it. Um, Again, I I spoke to two high-level evaluators last week, one a special assistant who's got a really, really good track record in the draft and and a national cross-checker who has a really, really good track record. They both said they think Robbie Snelling is the second best high school pitching prospect in this class um, behind only Dylan Lesko. So I think ultimately when you line the draft board up, yeah, Lesko probably still goes first. Uh, It's not quite the same situation as Lucas Giolito, but, you know, again, there is there was a sense Giolito that there are some injury concerns there that eventually came to fruition. He still went 16th overall. You know, maybe Lesko still goes in that same range, but. Don't be surprised if Robbie Snelling is the guy who goes 25th overall as the second high school pitcher off the board. He's he's a guy to really, really watch. Yeah, I mean, it just kind of speaks to the health, no pun intended, the health of the high school pitching class. There are a lot of names that you could throw into the hopper and make a case for. So, uh, Jonathan, really quick, do you got any any high school pitcher that kind of stands out for you? Um, no, not not really. I mean, I think the, those guys nailed it in terms of where Lesko can go. The, the problem is, is that you know, Giolito is the only real example of a high school guy uh, who everyone kind of knew, even though it wasn't known, known. Mm-hmm. Um, so no one really knows like, well, what happens after that. Giolito obviously has turned into a very good pitcher, but you know, I think there's more comfort level with the college guys. You have more track record. No one really knows what Tommy John for an 18 year old will do. You know, there's not there's not enough data on that. So I think that's the only reason why. You pause, you know, could he go in the middle of the first round? Sure. Could he go in, in a sandwich round where someone has extra picks? That's absolutely true. But I think that's true of high school pitching overall. Yeah. Where every year you take a guy like, oh, we easily could go here. And then so often those high school guys, especially the right handers, uh, tend to float down. So it wouldn't surprise me if if Snelling and, say, Jackson Ferris or Brandon Barrera go ahead of, of any of those right handers when all is said and done. Yeah. I mean, and uh, lest we discount the option that he could end up at Vanderbilt. You know, you never know, uh, especially with these injuries. All right, guys, we will end on one last kind of more fun topic. There's a billion names in this draft. Every one of us covers a different region. Let's go around the horn really quick. I just want to know who your who your draft crush is. I know I mentioned it already, Kyle, but that one guy that is maybe outside of the first round or a fringe first round guy, a deep cut, whatever you want, who's the guy you're rooting for that you really believe in? And Zach, you've seen more guys than anyone 
uh, especially on the high school ranks. Who's your guy? Man, I'm trying to think of like, <laughs> do I want to like try and go super deep cut or just go with like an obvious guy? Um, you strike me as indie band Brian, just the guy that <laughs> indie band their Brian. their band goes on the radio and you're playing to, playing to sixty seven people in a bar. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. exactly my vibe. Um, man, huh. all right. Uh, well, this isn't sexy, but like Dukanich is my guy. But anyways, beyond him, um, I, I'm a big Tucker Toman fan. I think he's got a chance to hit himself into the first round. And I will also go with Owen Murphy from Chicagoland. Murphy's a great As call. a hitter or a pitcher, whatever he wants. Take him. <laughs> he's really good at both. So, Kyle, how about you, man? Who, who sticks out? <laughs> it's a little bit of a cop-out. It's a pretty down year out here in California, um, to be honest. No one. If there was someone I'd seen that – you know, it's like, oh man, this guy's, you know, really, really good. And I think the industry's underrating him, I tell you, but I haven't seen that guy yet. Um, you know, maybe the closest I would get is I, I think Tyrese Turner at USC is a pretty good ball player. Um, good I really, I really like, you know, it's just, it's, you know, I've mostly seen him bat left handed, but just like a really smooth, nice line drive stroke. He's got more thump than you'd think for a guy as skinny as he is. I see him really drive some balls. He can run like crazy. Um, it's second base only. Something's wrong with his arm. It's gone way backwards since high school. I mean, it's it's a contact speed second base bat you probably take in the fifth round. But I would not be surprised to see him, you know, in the majors and having a more substantive career than maybe some of the other guys ahead of him. But again, it's not like a guy where I'm like banging the table. Oh my gosh, I love this guy. This is someone I'm going to stick my neck out for. It's more like yeah, this guy can do some things and I, I wouldn't be surprised if a few years from now he's better than we thought, but it's, it's again, I could also see him getting wood in his hands and struggling to hit the ball in the infield. Again, it's just, it's just not a great year in California. So unfortunately I haven't really seen that guy this year. Yeah. Deandre Smith kind of falls into that bucket a little bit too. Same school. What do yeah, you got, I mean, people like him. He's a little more famous. I'm actually probably a little more Turner over Smith based off what I've really? seen this year. Um, cool. I just I just think the pure hit is a little better. I like the athleticism better. But again, we're talking about guys in the third to fifth range here. It's it's not like we're talking you know we're talking future franchise cornerstone studs. Yeah, Jonathan, how about you, man? I'm going to cherry pick more from the top because I'm lazy. Um, no, uh, <laughs> I mean, first and foremost, I think I have to say contractually, uh, I have to talk about Cole Young because he's in my backyard here in Pittsburgh. Um, uh, but that's not really, he's not particularly sexy. I think he's the kind of guy that the more you see him, the more you like him. Even there's not a, one tool that really jumps off the page. But the guy that I, I, I tend to like guys who really know how to pitch and there's maybe some upside. And, you know, if, if it's a college guy, then it's a bonus. So for me, Gabe Hughes is a guy that I like. I think I like more than the industry does. And he's probably, you know, he's a first rounder. Um, he is benefiting from the injuries and the lack of college pitching depth, maybe more than anyone in the country. Uh, but, I, you know, I just like guys who have some projection. He's got three pitches. He can throw them all for strikes. Um Pacific Northwest guys, I tend to like because I think there's some ceiling there once they they get into into. Pro Thank you, ball. Jonathan. So, that's nice um, of you. Um, <laughs> there's no ceiling here. <laughs> yeah, so I would never put a ceiling on Joe Doyle or Gabe Hughes. But you know, so he's the guy that I kind of you know, uh, you know, if I were picking in that 11 to 15 range and the high school arms were worrying me and all those high school bats were gone, like I would think about maybe cutting a little deal and getting that guy because he's going to be a big league starter in my book. Yeah, that's a good call. He's he's really, really good. I've consistently gotten, you know, back the first round. And, and we see college guys work their way up. I think about, you know, Michael McGreevy last year began the year. Oh, you know, he was really good. He's probably a second rounder. And then you check in a few months later, hey, he's pitched his way into the comp round. And then eh, maybe it's back of the first. And then by the time we actually get to the draft, he's, you know, kind of going in the teams. So, I mean, I think there's, there's definitely a, a potential for a similar – outcome for Gabe Hughes here. That's that's a really good pick, Jonathan. He's a, he's a good pitcher just straight up. There's no better way to say it. It's just a good pitcher. Yeah. I don't think he gets enough credit for his athleticism either. He's a really physical guy, but he can really get down the mound. Um, all right. Well, just so the record shows it, I'll, I'll take New Jersey's own uh, Max Martin. I, I think he's an impressive shortstop physical. I think uh, he's a good value in the second round. And then uh, Texas's own Jalen Flores. I think the UT commit, uh, like the length, like the projection, like the ability to maybe stay on the left side with the power. Um, but guys, I think that's going to do it. 40 minutes. It's been fun. Uh, appreciate you guys coming on and, and chatting a little bit about the draft and 
two more months and, and we'll be on to 2023. Brian, I know that you are already enveloped in 2023. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. 23 starts like next week, brother. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, guys. It's been a pleasure. Until next time, we'll see you.